I'm going to be reading from a creative nonfiction essay called Body Memory. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about that. Um, so it's an essay that explores my relationship to the land um, here in Northeast Iowa and also um, in my old Northside Chicago neighborhood of Rogers Park. It's about how our bodies are connected to the land and how our identities are formed by the places that we inhabit. But it's also about how we violate land that was never ours to begin with, how the body can disintegrate right before our own eyes when we're not living in the right place or breathing the right air, and about how we can find mercy and relief when we take to our feet and walk out into the world. So the essay is about 11, 12 pages long, um, but I'm only going to be reading about seven pages of that. Um, and there are paragraphs here and there interspersed, OK? Um, but it should all make sense. <laughs> I tried really hard. <laughs> OK. Body memory. Lime green caterpillars dropped from low-hanging tree branches and into my hair. I found them after I had finished walking my dog in the Chicago heat, after I had already come inside, and I screamed when my fingers touched their soft bodies before I knew what they were. I can't remember now what I did with those caterpillars, if I set them outside on my wooden porch or squeeze them between two sides of a paper towel or wash them down the drain. It was around this time that a friend from Iowa described the memory of moths. He said that even after a caterpillar morphed into a moth, even after they turned to soup and reemerged from a cocoon, they could remember pain from before they could fly from before they could easily reverse a mistaken jump into an accidental world of skin, hair, bone, and itching human fingers. When a caterpillar builds herself a cocoon and encloses herself within its walls, she turns into a lumpy soup. The lime green dissolves and the brain melts and the fuzz and feet scatter. The leftovers, the parts and pieces the moth won't need, are thrown out. I imagine these leftovers leaking out of urn-shaped pupil chambers like a slow faucet drip. It was around this time, too, that I dreamt of a body in ruins. I dreamt of a perfectly round hole in my skin. This roundness splayed atop my sternum between my two breasts. I placed a finger upon the hole within it and felt a slick and polished plastic smoothness instead of the ragged and fraying edges I expected. I thought that maybe I could go someplace where someone might fill up this hole, where someone could glue the retracted skin back together. And all at once, I felt such shame because it was then when I realized my skin hadn't been ripped or torn and I was not bleeding, but still could not feel the bones within my body, that a certain hollowness occurred to me. Quite suddenly, I understood that my insides were cavernous, and if one were to place their mouth upon my sternum and their lips between my breasts and yell or scream down into me, they would hear only echoes, bouncing off skin stretched over nothing more than air. My friend from Iowa referred to a study conducted in 2008 by biologists Martha Weiss and Doug Blackiston. To test the memory of moths, Blackiston and Weiss dumped handfuls of caterpillars into electric boxes, filling the spaces between one cylindrical body and another with ethyl acetate gas. As the caterpillars smelled the gas, Blackiston zapped them. Blackiston said he repeated gas and shock exposure once an hour for eight hours. The caterpillars recognized that the ethyl acetate gas forewarned an imminent shock and they responded by curling and condensing into themselves, by pushing under and against each other. And even after the caterpillars turned to soup and sloshed around in their cocoons and rebuilt their melted brains, they still avoided the gas. How is it possible to remember something, anything, after your brain melts? How can the memory of pain transcend a type of death? Can a heritage of memories be passed on from one cellular being to another through earth stuff? How does a body in ruins know when to heal, where to find the right dirt? 
It does not escape my attention that although a caterpillar looks physically different from a moth and that the two share some, but not all, of the same cells and that those cellular building blocks have been reorganized during a biological meltdown, that the caterpillar and moth do in fact share the same memories of pain. But at what point does this inheritance occur? At what point does the soupy caterpillar whisper to the soupy moth, remember? As the skin of my scalp peeled in the heat, I pressed through an overgrown trail in Iowa at four mounds with a, with a friend and my father. This is the place where a series of peaks and shallow valleys survive as burial grounds of woodland Native Americans. And this is the place where my grandmother and I walked in autumn's past before I helped carry her coffin out of Holy Ghost Church and into the snow and she melted into ashes. I hiked ahead of the men, thorns and branches scratching my calves. I focused my eyes on tangled weeds and the narrow dirt path at my feet. But I remembered a path once well maintained and leaves tangerine and rust instead of green and a weak, cold sunlight instead of a heavy dusk. I looked for the four burial mounds, for the path that would take me to them. But the path was so overgrown that I could not orient myself and find my way, and I could not remember the path my grandmother always took to the burial clearing. I could see only the Mississippi and a tumble of fallen branches and the edge of a limestone bluff to my right and a slope of trees to my left. I ached to find the burial grounds. I thought that perhaps if I found the burial grounds, my hands might not clench into rigid fists as I slept, or that my forearms and wrists might quit swelling. I could no longer make out the small hills of my knuckles, and in the morning, I could only unfurl them just enough to turn on the water tap. I needed the dirt to soothe the bruises which appeared without cause on the underside of my bicep on the inside of my left knee, on the soles of my feet. Silence might settle the clench of my jaw, I thought. That morning, I caught myself biting down, obliterating the air between my molars so fiercely that I could not eat a sandwich or chew gum and could only open my mouth wide enough to slip in a straw, a toothbrush. I yearned to find a par parcel of earth I remembered. But instead, I could hear my father hollering to my friend about three-leaved poison ivy and dangerous red berries, and their feet stomped loud, and I just wanted quiet so I might find the place of slight peaks and narrow valleys. My fingers and neck were sweating, and my grandmother could no longer lead me, and I was wearing the wrong pants, and my father kept hollering, and I never did find what I was looking for. Just the other day, I read that $3 million worth of illegal construction occurred and was sanctioned by the National Park Service for the past 10 years at Effigy Mounds National Monument. The Effigy Mounds Park staff failed to conduct required archaeological surveys before building wooden boardwalks surrounding sacred burial mounds. Situated 65 miles north of Dubuque, Iowa, my childhood home, the effigy mound region stretches from Iowa northeast past the Wisconsin-Illinois border, covering a wide swath of land across southern Wisconsin from the Mississippi to Lake Michigan. It reaches up north of Iowa and into southeast Minnesota, creating a space of land that, if traced out on a map, looks akin to a measuring cup used to portion sugar or flour, or cornmeal. The land which is now deemed a national park, which is now called Effigy Mounds, has been sifted through, shoveled up, filled with dozens of the dead. The living, once piled mounds of earth atop the bodies in the shapes of birds with wings outstretched, of bear and deer, of turtle, panther and bison. It was during the late woodland period when the effigy mound builders began constructing the earthen bears and birds for both burial and ceremonial purposes. And today there are native, 18 native tribes who lay claim to the mounds. I witnessed these earthen phenomena before the construction and the boardwalks and the poured concrete. I laid both eye and palm against grass growing out of earth, nourished by bodies gone, and have imagined dirt moved, shaped, and packed, with hands warm and deft and strong. 
As a child, I walked among the bear and bird and snake, and I could not speak. My eyes ran wild and kept pace with my breath, but I felt a strong impulse towards silence. What I sensed as a child, but did not then fully realize, was that those mounds, those northeastern bluffs, and the land of effigy did not belong to me. They rightfully belonged, and still do, to the descendants of those buried within the mounds. Though I claim the land and corn, the hills and rivers of Iowa as my own, as my homeland, the effigy mounds are not mine. And those illegal boardwalks, the trees that were chopped, peeled, processed, and staked into the ground seem to me a sign that we are all still far away from recognizing each other and the ways in which we are and are not entitled to the land surrounding our bodies. Even though I didn't then realize that the mounds were not mine, that the shaped earth did not belong to me or my, my ancestors, I did sense words unsaid and a great grief. It took me years to feel the threads which fasten land to body, and years to understand how the body grieves when it loses its land. It took me years to listen to my limbs, to understand that when my skin peels and my wrist bones ache, and it seems that my muscles cannot be loosened or my creaky ankles silenced, that I should listen to my body and seek out a land it remembers. I often wonder if a body can belong to land while alive. Maybe in death, the body, buried and breaking down and becoming dirt, belongs to the land because it is the land. But while the body lives, perhaps it is the opposite. It is the land which belongs to the limbs. Particles of earth which built the body, which stretch the skin and grow the hair, are the body. Is this why my body, the way it moves and speaks and responds, changes as the landscape does? Is this why the moth remembers the caterpillar's pain? Is this why my ankles, knees, and neck creak in the wind and my spine feels compressed as I walk among skyscrapers in Chicago? The wind claws at my face in Chicago and so I mask it with thick globs of moisturizing cream. I soak in hot bath water mixed with Epsom salt to heal bruising which seems to spontaneously appear. I think of soup and I swell. I remember my body made plastic, slick and polished without bones. Calves, arches and quadriceps constrict so close they spring and unravel. My heart is seething. And so I walk to reel the unraveled back inside, and I ask my body to love the rattle of the train and the sheets of reflective glass soldered onto heights of steel beams holding the city together. But I suspect that it is the earth stuff to which we belong, and it seems to be the earth stuff which our bodies remember and which passes our mem memories onto <coughs> other bodies through dirt stuck under fingernails and pollen caught in noses. I ask my body to love what it cannot, and it ignores my pleas, chanting in creaks and pops that we are not yet home. When I read that muscles have memory of their former strength, I thought of moths. I wondered about the muscles of a moth, their size and shape and density. I wondered if a moth's memory might be housed in its muscles, or if it prevails exclusively in the brain a trilobed roundness, smaller than a pin, pinhead, within which one million nerve cells crowd together. I read that even if muscle mass is lost, the muscle nuclei remain and remember. But over time and as age wears on, it becomes more difficult for muscle to develop and cultivate and cleave to the memory of its strength. My quadriceps remember the sharp incline of a hill, and my calves remember stretching and retracting as they jumped from one expansive rock to another. My iliotibial band remembers balancing and stabilizing as I stood up on pedals to slowly climb a steep stretch of bike trail. It does not escape me that hills remain absent from Chicago, that Chicago is a flat land, and the only thing to climb here are stairs. Could it be that my limbs refuse to move fluidly along the flatness of Chicago because they remember the hills? This upturned, excavated, and cemented land which curves against Lake Michigan is not where the memories of movement developed, is not a place the limbs recognize, 
is not the homeland. This past summer, I walked in search of a place in Chicago that my body might understand the way it understands forested hills. Often, I found myself walking to Western Avenue. From my apartment in, Rogers, in the Rogers Park neighborhood of Chicago, on the corner of Tui and Polina, I walked south until I reached Lunt, and then turned my eyes west. On my way to Western, I passed, each time, a narrow, newly built two-story town house with toys purposefully placed in the front yard in a way that reminded me of a shrine. Giant ladybugs, plastered and painted, encircled the narrow trunk of a young tree. Stones, pale and gray and rusted, stood upright in a circle around a plastic baby doll who sat upon more stones piled together into a throne. Wreathed around the baby doll's head was a red headband with a damaged, clumped, and stringy feather attached. A tan loincloth surrounded the doll's waist, and his left arm remained raised so that his plastic palm seemed to cover his plastic ear. Behind the doll were standing, resting, and toppled plastic toy horses. Bay horses, chestnut horses, horses mottled gray and white with black manes, a caramel-colored horse with a crimped mane, and two horses with plastic Native American figurines astride, one molded to shoot a bow. And behind stood a teepee made with cloth of layered colors, neon yellow atop white, scarlet atop tangerine, atop powdery blue. The fabric was embossed with black cartoon-style characters. Two bears, a person with wild hair and thin legs, legs playing a wind instrument, a bird flying frozen close by. At the very top of the teepee, where the supporting beams of the tent stuck out, sky high flew an American flag. And all of this seemed so out of place that now I can't help but wonder at that front yard, at the plastic hands and faces, and the flag hung as a representative body of the nation. I wonder if that front yard scene is in fact a shrine or is instead a statement of cultural domination. I think about who owns that small parcel of land and what those owners mean to say with one plastic body elevated on stone and the others stuck in the ground below. I think most of all about what it means that my body stood curious before those pla posed plastic bodies, all of us scuffed the same. After I reached Western, turned around, and walked back east for some time, I passed a front yard where a beheaded plastic mannequin stood inside a wooden pyre. The first time I passed the pyre, I screamed. I remembered the slick and polished plastic smoothness of my body in ruins, of skin stretched over nothing more than air, of the fearful body I dreamt. For a moment, I thought the body alive, I thought the body mine. I thought, too, of forsaken bodies melted, of the way a confined body disintegrates, crumbles, and churns, even as it clutches memory. I thought of the resilience of moths and the resilience of peoples fighting to pass a heritage of memories on to the future. I thought of false claims and accusations, of land stolen, of the way people have historically manipulated trees to maim, string up, stab, and burn. And I remembered that before construction crews came in to jackhammer the pavement and spread blacktop in my Chicago neighborhood, the cement had cracked and buckled and caved from ice and snow and rain, and I could see the red bricks that lay beneath. It's often easier to pave over history, to smooth it away, rather than tear it up and carve it on stones and into the vessels that house our blood. And it seemed to me then, that day by the pyre, a very real and true concept that living in a land which is not your own, which is not your homeland, which your cells do not remember, can break and buckle the body. Sometimes when I walk, the thunder comes. Rain follows, too. I keep walking, though. I walk as far as my feet can stand, and then I turn around and walk some more. And one day, as I walked, white puffs of dandelion began to fall from the sky. It might be more accurate to say that the air around and above and before me filled with floating puffs of dandelion. 
I looked up and around to see from where they fell. They landed on my face and in my hair, and I rubbed them between my fingers. And suddenly, the idea of where I came from seemed fuzzy. And I closed my eyes and opened my hands. The rain washed the dandelions from my body, and the rain kept coming down, and I walked on. Thank you. So if anyone has any questions about really anything about the essay itself or, I don't know, my writing process, the content, whatever. If you have any questions, I can field them. Um, I've been to Effigy Mountains a number of times. Um, and when I was doing research for this essay, um, I stumbled across this NPR article, and so I was talking about this. So it was all um, kind of coincidental, like the things that were happening that summer and that I was stumbling across in my research. I was doing a lot of research that summer for my thesis, but a lot of it was I was reading like medical texts on the way that memory worked biologically, and so I was reading all of these like really difficult texts, and all of these like other things kept happening that seemed so coincidental. Um, and I started to see like connections between these things. Like my friend was talking about moths and a caterpillar fell in my hair. And there was this like crazy yard that I literally passed every day on my walk that had Native Americans in it. And I stumbled across this article. And so I started seeing like all of these convergences. Um, and my mentor had like just been talking to me about convergences. And so it was really weird. Um, and that's kind of where this essay came from and why it's so braided, why we go from topic to topic to topic, and I try to pull it together through questions. I think imagery is really important. Part. I mean, it's a really important part of fiction, um, and in nonfiction, sometimes they focus, writers focus more on like the what happened of a specific event or something like that, or experience. Um, but I think imagery is really, really important. Um, among other things, but it keeps the reader interested. I mean, if I can't imagine something in my head when I'm reading it and kind of like go there in my mind, then I don't really see the point of reading it for me um, unless it's some sort of like academic text I need to learn something. Um, but so I want to make my writing like that. <laughs> so this also kind of like straddles the fiction versus nonfiction debate. Right? What's fiction? What's nonfiction? What are memories? Are they factual? Um, and often readers, especially like um, um, those who read like commercial nonfiction that's really popular, think that exactly what they read is exactly how they happen, how it happened in real life. And that's of course not even close to being the truth. Um, but then they feel betrayed when they find out that of course it's not anywhere close to being the truth. Um, and so. I think um, memory, when I started really getting into nonfiction, that was a question that I asked myself as a reader. Um, and I um, had been reading a lot and thinking about, OK, you know, how could they have remembered this? And so um, once I got to grad school, that was all in undergrad. So when I got to grad school, I just really found myself interested not only in the um, the biological and philosophical aspects of memory, but of like my own memories personally. And I wanted to know how they had changed over time um, in different ways. And so yeah, I really did read a lot of science textbooks to figure out like how our cells and the chemicals in our minds like actually change every single time we remember something. So like if I'm thinking back to, this is like a silly example, but like what I ate yesterday, um, the fact, uh, the process of re remembering that actually um, changes the structure of the memory itself in our cells. So every time we remember something, we get farther and farther and farther away from the truth because it remolds and reshapes every single time. Um, and that's like uh, amazing and terrifying all at the same time. I mean, it really is, like, um, because I feel like our memories are such an integral part of our identities. Um, the way we remember our past really does shape our present and, you know, oftentimes our future. And so if we're remembering things that likely 
didn't happen the way we remember them or didn't happen at all, right? Like how does that change who we are as a person? I don't know if you've read any studies, but there are researchers out there who are literally implanting memories into people's brains. This sounds like sci-fi stuff, but it's work that's been going on for like 10, 15 years. And it's for real. And they like test it on like soldiers. Um, a lot of it is like implanting traumatic memories into people's brains. And they like genuinely think that that happened to them. And so the memory is like a crazy thing that we know very little about. And so therefore, it's really interesting to me. I just, I just and so in my thesis and other essays, that idea of membering, of like the limbs, the members of our body, the remembering, the dismembering, all of that play on words is really um, connected thematically. And I have also crazy dreams. I'm like an insane dreamer, like really crazy guys. <laughs> and so like that, all of that really, um, you know, connects to me. Like I have this like world I go into that does not exist in the real world and I like explore and go around it. And sometimes those memories kind of like mesh into what's real and I have to ask myself that question, what's real, what's not. And then that S is, brings up a whole other bigger philosophical question about, well, of course dreams are real, but so, you know. But um, when I was writing about the moths and the caterpillars, I thought it was just absolutely insane that, you know, so a caterpillar is alive and then in order to transform, you know, that metamorphosis, it completely breaks down biologically. And all of the, the cells, you know, are still contained within the pupil chamber, but they completely reform, which means that the brain and the memory and everything completely breaks down. But when it grows back up into a moth, it remembers all of those memories from when it was a caterpillar. Like, how is that possible? That's so crazy. Um, and so then I was thinking, like, well, if that can happen, what other memories can be passed on through, like, the earth? Because, of course, we are all made, literally, our cells are, from the earth, right? Um, from star stuff and dirt. And so um, all of that is connected, I think, yeah. That research started with the descendants of Holocaust survivors. Um, and the descendants, so like the children of someone who had survived, um, would you know ask themselves like, why do I feel as much pain and like horrible memories as like my father who went through all of this? And it's because um, when a person goes through a trauma, um, their brain is literally parts of it can be reorganized and chemically and biologically it changes the the shape of the, the DNA, the helix, um, and of the, the coding. And so when you have a kid, that alternate coding is passed on. Um, so the trauma is literally coded into DNA and is passed on to the next generation. Um, and so I know it's really, it's really sad and scary um, and crazy also that we're like connected to each other in that way, that like we don't even know it right now, but like our DNA was shaped by the traumas of things that happened to our descendants and it's affecting us and we might not even know because we're not aware of those traumas. So um, yeah, it's really cool research. It's really easy to find too if you're, I think there's like a lay person's article you could read in Wired that <laughs> describes it like easily to people who aren't used to reading that kind of research, so.